Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. A couple of Patreon supporters asked me why I never review any Anritsu instruments. And that's actually not something that I'm doing on purpose. It's just that a relationship between Anritsu and I was never established. I really, never really heard from them. But we've repaired Anritsu equipment in the past, of course, on the website. And I went ahead and I bought this one. This is an Anritsu MG3700A. This is a 6 gigahertz arbitrary waveform generator plus synthesizer. So it's a vector signal generator. And it's uh, some pretty good specification. And this one is actually fully loaded. The only option it doesn't have is the rubidium standard, which is interesting to know that this could actually have a rubidium standard. This is a discontinued model, of course. But uh, yeah, I think it would be good to take a look at it, even if we can't fix it, as always. Analyzing it and reverse engineering and then figuring out how it works is always good. And see how the Japanese built their vector signal generators. So here it is, it's plugged in. If I go ahead and turn it on, so I can hear the power supply start but uh, then nothing else happens. And I happen to know that it has more than just one problem. That's how it was listed on eBay when I bought it. So it's gonna be quite a lot of investigation to figure out what's going on. It just sits here like this. So I hope it's not some kind of a weird firmware corruption because that might be impossible to fix. So let's take a look inside of this instrument and see what's going on. I'm not gonna talk about the RF yet. We can leave that at the end since that's not the issue right now. There's some stuff at the top that's RF related. And the main power supply at the bottom is a TDK Lambda. I've actually repaired one of those in a different video for a totally different instrument. So let's take a look and see what we have here. So here's the two boards at the top. This is a, most likely the arbitrary waveform generator board. We can see a TX tag over here from analog devices, Vertex 2 Pro FPGA, memory on both sides. So this is basically a streaming device. It grabs data from here, pushes it through this and then that eventually finds its way into uh, the mixers on the output of the arbitrary waveform generator part. So these two boards have to be pulled out. There's a main motherboard over here where everything is pulled in. It's interesting, there's another connector over here which another board can plug into. I'm not sure what that would be for because I don't think there's any option that this is missing. But either way, we're going to have to remove these to see what's underneath it because without that, you actually cannot uh, see the main processor where the main firmware and everything resides. And then on the other side of this, and behind all of this from the bottom of the instrument is all the RF portion. And we can take a look at that later if we get to it so that we can see how the instrument actually works. So I have to fiddle around a little bit with this more to find out how to get to the processor. And here's the main processor board. I removed the card that was in front of it simply by sliding it out. And you can see a lot of familiar components on here. There's actually a lot of line driver components all around as well. There's a 32-bit RISC processor over here and a Hitachi 32-bit ARM processor. This component here is labeled AX51901. It's from Axel, I believe. I have no idea what it is. I, I couldn't find anything meaningful about it. And uh, there is a, an Altera A6 FPGA, a bunch of memory, static RAM memory. There is a Max221 over here, which is a serial port converter, of course. And there's a connector here. So I wonder if there's a serial interface into one of these processors that could be potentially helpful. And there's two flash memories here in a socket and one more over here. And those could be the firmware or at least some kind of parts of firmware. So if we, maybe if that's the problem, if we could have another one of these units, we could maybe replicate that and see if that could help us. But there's also a lot of voltages labeled on this board and a couple of LEDs in different places. So we can still power it on like this and see if it does anything. All right, here we go, the instrument's turned on. And the very first thing to note is that none of these LEDs, a whole bunch of them over here, a whole bunch of them over there, none of them are actually on, no activity at all. Most of these components are also quite cold. I can pull out the thermal camera and take a look, but I don't feel anything on them. So there's a couple of voltages labeled here. We can measure them. Here is 1.5 volts. You see, there we go, that's nice, 1.5 volt. There's good. And there was a whole bunch of them over here as well. Let me see, here's the 3.3 volt backup voltage. There you go, 2.6, okay, maybe the battery is a little bit low, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. There's an LED up here for the hard drive, it's also not blinking. Here is 3.3 volts. Oh, look at that, 0.4 volts. Okay, that's a good start. Here's a 5 volt supply, 1.7. Huh, that is strange. Okay, so something is indeed going on with the power supplies. That's actually a good sign, because that, that could be the easiest thing to fix. Let's see, there's a 12 volt here. Okay, 12 volt is there. There is a plus 12 volt header here. That 12 volt is here. That's interesting. So here's a, f okay, I see two fuses. One fuse over here, one fuse over here. I'm gonna measure on the right side of this fuse. I do see 3.3 volts. That must be a separate one, because this 3.3 volt is there. There's a fuse over here. On one side of the fuse, I measure 1.7. And on the other side of the fuse, Oh, it's very difficult to reach that. Five volts. Oh, that fuse is dead. 
Interesting. Okay, this fuse is open because on one side of it I measure 1.7 and on the other side I measure 5 volts, which I think I was just measuring a moment ago. Pretty sure it's there somewhere. It's hard to reach it. Okay, so if that fuse is there, there it is, here's 5 volt. So if that fuse is actually w uh, not blown, we have to look at why. I see two DC DC converters over here, so this could be the reason. I don't want to just replace the fuse, I have to think about this a little bit more carefully. Now, the, f the other side of the fuse, where we see that the fuse is blown, is not shorted. Because if it were, we wouldn't see this 1.7 volt hanging there. That means that it's, it probably has some voltage from somewhere else being fit fed back to it, because there's so many semiconductors here. Somewhere there's probably some back feed voltage coming into it. So that could explain it. Well, I'm going to take a look at this fuse a little bit more closely and find out if there's potentially we could supply this very slowly with an external power supply, overriding the internal one in a safe way so we don't damage anything else in case that say this DC DC converter is the source of the problem. So let me set some things up here. So this is the power of the circuit that we're dealing with. This fuse is okay, this fuse is not. The 5 volt plane is existing on this side and it's fed to the other side and feeds this 5 volt part. This also is sitting at 1.7 volts. And I believe it's also running this DC DC converter which is supposed to be 3.3 volts and that one is dropping down to 0.7. I think this is just simply not getting the kind of voltage it needs, obviously, in order to convert it to 3.3 volts. So this failure of fuse is probably not allowing anything, the rest of the circuit, to be powered on anyway, and of course nothing works. But the question of why this is dead is still uh, unknown. So first I'm going to remove it, obviously, because it needs to be done. And then we can think about maybe either powering this from an external 5 volt power supply, which is the only supply you need to provide it here, by the, after I remove this fuse, and then we turn it all on synchronously and see what happens, and then we can current limit the 5 volt supply. And if that doesn't work, then we'll have to dig in a little bit deeper. So let's go ahead and use the Roden Schwarz NGP 800 power supply, which is an absolutely fantastic power supply. I have it set to 5 volts and 2.5 amps. This originally, the fuse was at 5 amps, so this is about halfway where it should be, and of course it's going to current limit as necessary. And I've connected it to the test points, the 5 volt test point and the ground. So I'm going to turn these on at the same time and see if we get anything interesting happening. We can also have an eye on those LEDs. And here we go. Ooh, LEDs! And it's only drawing 1.3 amps! LEDs, it's flashing, it's booting! Yes, it's working! Okay, good. So, it's only taking 1.25 amps. So I think we're safe. And uh, yep, yeah, all the LEDs are turning on, it's going through the boot process. So, looking good. Okay, now we can turn our attention slowly to the rest of the unit. Okay, here we go, the fuse has been replaced. Now the cause of the failure of the old fuse may have been some transient effects or over time, you know, sometimes this does happen to fuses, but given that we measured the current consumption of this portion of the circuit and it is below 2 amps and the fuse was for 5 amps, I'm fairly confident that it's going to be fine. Alright, here we go. So the instrument now boots perfectly fine and don't see any particular problems with it. If you go under utility and then we go under the hardware check, you can see that the CPU module, the IF module, and the RF module all pass their own self-test, which is great. We go back to the frequency here. You can see there's the oven cold is blinking. That's probably something that takes a bit of time. We'll keep an eye on it until the oven controlled crystal oscillator comes up to temperature. So we're at 1 gigahertz, 0 dBm. I have connected the output directly to the FSL spectrum analyzer, which I repaired in the previous video. There's no signal right now, but the amplitude is set to 0 dBm. So I'm going to enable it. There we go. There it is. You can see that the signal is there. If I do a new search, you can see we do have a tone at 1 gigahertz minus 1.9 dBm being measured. That is good. Okay, let me turn this off. Let's go ahead and increase the frequency here. Uh, let's go by 100 megahertz at a time. That's not what I wanted to do. There we go. 1.2 gig. It's fine. Looks good. Let's go to 2.2 2 gigahertz. Let's do a new search. Yep, 2.2 gigahertz minus 2 dBm. That looks good. Let's go to 2.5, still okay, 2.8 gigahertz, 2.9 gigahertz, and 3 gigahertz. Let's do a new search. Yep, 3 gigahertz looks good. Oh, there you go, something happened. So now that we have an ALC alarm and the output is gone. If I do a new search, you can see that the signal is there, 3.3 gigahertz, minus 29 dBm. So something is wrong here above 3 gigahertz. You go higher, the signal is kind of following. So the synthesizers are fine. There you go, 4.1 gigahertz. So the tones are correct. ALC alarm means that it's obviously not able to measure the output power coming out, and this is definitely not from the attenuator, because if it was the attenuator problem, you would see it below 3 gigahertz also. It's the same attenuator, it's broadband. 
So something else is going on. It is likely that internally, the architecture of this instrument splits the signal generation below and above 3 GHz differently. And that's probably why, you probably can't read this from here, but this MG3700A is actually a 3 GHz synthesizer. You can add the option, which takes it from 3 to 6 as an additional thing, and this one does have that. That means it must be a separate piece, and that's the part that's not working. Well, this is a good opportunity for us to go and take a look at the RF part and see if we can clear this last problem with it and get it fully functional. Yeah, and then we can also try the entire baseband generator. These buttons are not very good. There we go. It's got, it's got an internal arbitrary wave from generator. It actually has 120 megahertz of bandwidth uh, from its own internal arbit, which is quite a lot. So this is quite good, especially for the age of the instrument. So I'm eager to see if we can fix it up. Well, after doing a lot of searching on the internet, I did manage to find what appears to be some kind of a marketing document. And in there, there is the block diagram of the instrument. A very rough one, but it's going to be still quite a bit of help here for us. So on the left side, we have the IQ baseband generator, because this one obviously has that. And then there is two D2A converters and some low-pass filtering, which generates our I and Q signals going into the IQ modulator. This would be the internal modulation path. And this actually comes out of the instrument, too. So you can use, and it has differential I and Q output, which is fantastic, and allows you to use the internal arbitrary wave from generator right at IF, and we've seen this uh, from several different instruments. And you can also put your own external IQ input, which can have even a slightly higher bandwidth, going into the IQ modulator core. That is being fed from a 100 megahertz reference, which is multiplied by 8, so that's what's coming out of the IQ modulator up to about 800 megahertz or so. And then we have some pulse modulation on top of this, so you can pulse modulate your signal that's coming out. So if you have a long stream by pulse modulation, you can do some bursty transmissions, all the good stuff that comes with pulse modulation. And then after that, we have the ALC. So this ALC is going to ensure that the signal coming from all the different ports that enters it are leveled. And this is, goes back to the variable gain amplifiers in different stages to make sure that when you tell the instrument produces 0 dBm, it does internal loopback to make sure that 0 dBm is as accurately as it can be, considering its own calibration. So then after that, things get a little bit more interesting. We have a 4 GHz fixed oscillator that's fed onto the first mixer, and that allows the signal to be upconverted. And then from there, we have a yig tuned oscillator. And that yig tuned oscillator is mixed yet again with that signal. And this is how we get the tuning. So some of the tuning is coming from here, some of the tuning is coming from here. All of these were produced our CW tone at the very end. Now, if you look over this, there's a dotted line around this block. And that's the 6 gigahertz option. So the signals between 3 to 6 gigahertz are produced with another two mixers after this. So if you don't have this portion, you obviously don't need the rest of this section. They probably remove it and not populate it, or maybe it's there and it needs a softer option. But this is the part that most likely has an issue. So we get our up to about 3 gigahertz roughly correctly. You can see that we have a detector here. This detector is fed back to the ALC module. And then on this side, we have another detector. This detector also goes back to the ALC module. That's why the instrument knows that up at around 3 gigahertz, you're not getting what you want anymore. And that's precisely because this ALC simply is not receiving the signal it's expecting to receive. Now, the way it generates between 3 to 6 gigahertz is that it has yet another mixer and then yet another one in order to reach the higher frequencies. And there is a doubler here that doubles the yik tone oscillator frequency. So that goes up fairly high, actually, in order to downconvert eventually to the frequency you want. It's a little bit similar to a spectrum analyzer, the way the super heterodyne architectures work. And there's a power amplifier over here, too. So we know, therefore, that a step attenuator has nothing to do with the problem, as we saw from the measurement. Normally, synthesizers have no knowledge of what the signal is at the output port. They don't touch this one. They don't look at anything after the step attenuator. They assume that that's fairly predictable and reliable. And you can even take that into account when you calibrate, because you can put that lookup table inside the ALC, taking into account the step attenuator. So if this guy is reporting that we don't have enough power above 3 gigahertz, then this, is, this the problem is must be here. It can't be in this one. It can't be the 4 gigahertz. It can't be the yik tuned oscillator, because all of these signals are necessary for the 3 gigahertz part to work. And since that's working, it is likely that none of these are the problem. The problem must be, in fact, contained within this box. So now we can go back to the unit and take a look at it and see if we can find out where that box is and then eventually find out what part of it is died, if we can. Now you can also, there's also some more details about how the baseband works, but there is a picture here, which is the back of the instrument. And if you look, the IQ output comes out of this connector, which is so strange, and why not put them onto BNCs? I mean, there's lots of room over here. This means that now you have to have another proprietary connector and then get that into a coax. It's just such a headache. Luckily, in the front of the instrument, you do have the IQ input, classical BNC connector, so you could use that. 
And I also now understand what this Ethernet port in the front is. It's actually just a bypass. So there's only one Ethernet in the back, and then you can buy this little jumper cable, connect this front to the here, and then that brings the Ethernet to the front of the instrument. A little bit unusual, but I guess it works. OK, good. So let's go back to the unit and take it apart. And here is the back of the instrument where all the RF goodness is, or at least most of them are. So here's the front panel connector over here. And right over here we have our mechanical itinerary made by Anritsu. And this mechanical itinerary is controlled by this mechanical itinerary controller board, which then itself is controlled by this board over here. So I think the Yikton oscillator and some of the other oscillators are on the other side of the instrument. And then they're brought in with these connectors at the very top. So there's two main boards here, the one over here and the one over here. And it's very obvious that this one connected to the chassis and has most of the signals going in and out of it is the primary IQ modulator as well as the first mixer. So the output of that is one of those outputs goes into this unit, which is an, a mechanical RF relay, which then switches between a low band and a high band, uh, below 6 gigahertz and above, uh, below 3 gigahertz and above 3 gigahertz. And if you look at this one over here, it has four connections, aside from its DC connection over here. There's one, two, three, and four. One of them goes into this. That's obviously its output. And the other three come from this board. And those are the two LOs that it needs, as well as the input, of course, which then needs to get up converted to the appropriate frequency. So what, where we need to focus our attention is this one to see if anything's wrong with this. So we're going to take this cover off and look at the circuits underneath, and then we can make sure that the signals we think are coming into it, the 4 gigahertz as well as the Yikton oscillator and everything is actually arriving here. So we can find out exactly at what point in the signal flow it stops working. And here is what is inside of our 3 to 6 gigahertz module, which is a suspect module in this case, and we know roughly how it works. So it should be very easy to reverse engineer at this point. So if you look at the four ports that are coming into it, they're actually labeled on the silk screen, which makes it even easier. We have the IF port coming in. This IF port has already the modulation on top of it. It already also has been applied first mixer from the other module to it. And you can see that it enters the input port of this mixer, the IF port of it, which means that this mixer is an upconvert mixer, at least in most scenarios, and the RF comes out of it. Now, the LO entering it is our first LO. That's our 4 gigahertz fixed LO, which has some bowtie filtering on it, and it enters the LO port. What comes out is actually upconverted. So then you may ask, well, why would you upconvert this? What's the benefit of going way above the frequency you want so that you're going to have to use a much, much higher LO frequency and mixer to bring it back down? What else has to do with, at least one of the reasons, has to do with fractional bandwidth of generally filtering things. It makes filtering much easier. Now, all of these filter structures you see, these hairpins, these bow tie filters, they can be tuned to any standard frequency. They will have, of course, varying performances, but their fractional bandwidth is roughly the same. So, for example, you build a bandpass filter at 10 gigahertz, and you hit a fractional bandwidth of, let's say, 30 gigahertz. That's a 3 gigahertz bandwidth around 10. Now, if you build the same filter now at 6 gigahertz, it's going to have roughly the same fractional bandwidth, about 30%. But now that translates to only 1.8 gigahertz. So when you go to higher frequencies, it is a lot easier to build a bandpass filter that has a wider bandwidth and therefore can cover, let's say, the entire 3 to 6 gigahertz you're interested in. So by upconverting it first to a higher frequency and then filtering it very carefully, you can isolate all the other frequencies you're not interested in and only keep the frequencies that you want which at the end translate to 3 to 6 gigahertz. This is one of the reasons why this is done. Now, of course, there's a disadvantage. Every time you do this, means you have to go to higher frequencies. Components are more expensive. They may be more lossy. They may have more noise figure. And in general, there are other disadvantages. But this strategy of what is called frequency planning is very common, not just in test and measurement equipment, but also in communication systems in general. This harmonic rejection and so on is, is very crucial, especially if you have to abide by FCC regulation in communication systems. So. Having said that, the IF comes in, the LO comes in, this gets upconverted, filtered, some pin diode attenuation, it looks like, along the way, and it goes through some Hittite power amplifiers. These guys are now quite a bit higher frequency, of course, and then it enters another mixer. Now it enters the mixer from its RF port, and then the LO port of the mixer is coming from here, and the IF is now down converted between 3 to 6 gigahertz, goes through an amplifier, goes through a power amplifier. This is a Maycom part, and it seems to have a uh, output saturated power of over one watt. They're probably not using the entire range, of course. And if you look carefully, you can see this line thins out, and then there's a coupler embedded right over here, very thin line. One side of that coupler is uh, terminated. The other side goes into a detector. I believe this is where the ALC circuit is, and that's how it knows that we're not getting the power we want because nothing's coming out of this. And eventually that makes it to this connector, and that goes to the output after our mechanical relay. Over here we have our Yiktun oscillator second LO come in, amplifier, 
And then it goes through this component here, which is a frequency doubler. We saw that in the uh, block diagram as well. And this frequency doubler is passive, meaning that it only has a diode in it. Can't really call it quite passive, but it doesn't have any amplifiers built into it, which means it has a huge conversion loss. I think something like 15 to 17 dB. So it's a big, big loss. And after that, therefore, it needs two power amplifiers, medium power amplifiers, again, to boost it back up so that it can enter the LO port of this mixer. So that's it. Very, very straightforward. Based on the block diagram, you're going to have the down converter over here, 3 to 6 gigahertz. So any of these components could be bad. Any of these amplifiers could be bad. Any of these ports could be bad. But we have to break it down at some point and do it one step at a time. First thing, the most logical thing, is to test to make sure all the signals entering it, the LOs, as well as the IF, are actually there at the correct value. And if you're satisfied with that, we will measure one step at a time using an active probe to find out where the signal eventually fails to go forward. Well, let's go ahead and follow some of these signals on this 6 GHz board. Now, I was going to use an active probe at first, but I thought maybe I'll show you a slightly different way to do it, which is not using an active probe. It's much, much cheaper, but it also has huge limitations, so you have to keep that in mind. So here is what I have. Basically, I have a DC block here, and connected to the SMA cable, and on the other side, I have a vertical SMA connector. These SMA connectors are basically meant to be soldered onto a board, and it has two screw holes, so you basically have, it will sit like this. Now, what the advantage of this is that the, the pin is fairly sharp, and you can actually trace and touch different places on this board. The reason I have the DC block is because my spectrum analyzer doesn't support DC, but if your spectrum analyzer is AC coupled, you don't even need this. The disadvantage of this, of course, is that this is a 50 ohm interface, and you touch it to something, and you're going to load that line. Not only are you going to load it with something that has a 50 ohm termination, you're going to load it with a really poor impedance, actually, because your ground isn't even connected. You're just kind of making this really bad transition from these coplanar waveguides on the board into a coaxial interface. It's not going to be good, but it will tell you if a signal is present, and you can couple a lot of power out of it. It will mess the rest of the circuit up, of course, but in most cases it may not matter. Much, much cheaper than using an active probe. Again, has a huge limitation, but let's try it out, see if this works for us. Okay, so here's our spectrum analyzer, and yes, I do recognize the irony of trying to save some money in an active probe while I'm using a Keysight MXAB that's fully loaded. But of course, this is just an example. This is the one that's easiest to use, and I really like the spectrum analyzer. All right, so let's go ahead and try this out. I'm going to turn the instrument on, and I'm going to tell you exactly where I'm probing. And all of those probe locations are going to follow our block diagram analysis and the board overview I just did. Okay, let's start with the frequency that's going to the doubler. Let's make sure that frequency is working. So we're looking at, I've set the instrument to 3.5 gigahertz. Now that's going to create a series of LO frequencies we need to expect. So let's measure the LO coming from the YIC to an oscillator, see if it's present. Here it is. Look at that, it's nice, 6.15 gigahertz. This is a signal that's going to get amplified, so I'm going to go past the amplifier. Here it is. You can see it's now a bit larger. Nice. I'm going to go past the doubler. There it is. You can see it's been doubled. It's sitting over here. Now it's sitting at 12.3 gigahertz. Its amplitude is quite a bit smaller because, as I said, this doubler doesn't have its own amplifier. I'm going to go past the first amplifier after the doubler. It should be much larger. There you go. Very nice. And I'm going to go past the second amplifier to the input of the mixer. And it should be even bigger than that. There you go. There it is. So it is basically a nice LO at 12.3 GHz going into our second mixer. Now let's go back to the first mixer. The first mixer should have one of its LO be 4 GHz. So let's measure that. There you go. 4 GHz coming in. Nice and large signal. Perfect. Now the IF going into this mixer should be at 4.8 GHz. You should be able to measure that. It's going to be much smaller in amplitude. There it is. 4.8 GHz. So when these two mix together, you get 8.8. .8. And 8.8 .8 is going to mix the LO signal, which I measured, this one. It's going to mix with 12.3, and that's going to, of course, give us 3.5. So let's look at the output of the first mixer. That output now should be at 8.8 .8 gigahertz. I'm going to land on that. And look at that. So 8.8 .8 gigahertz is somewhere around here. This is actually our LO feed-through that we're measuring. That's not good. It's, it's much, much larger than it should be. So let's go ahead and turn this peak search off. And let's set, put the marker at 8.8 .8 gigahertz. There it is. So it's very, very small. Now, I don't really like that. I don't like the fact that this signal is so much smaller than it should be. So now if I go all the way to the RF input of the other mixer, and I measure that, and you can see the signal is essentially not even present. So the signal is lost somewhere after the first mixer. 
So let's do a bit of more analysis on this. Now what appears to be here is a pin diode or an attenuator, most likely a pin diode switch. This is on the yellow path of this first mixer. When this entire part of the circuit is disabled, this pin diode actually turns off and I'll show you that. And this in disables the yellow signal from coming over here, which means no up conversion happens right at the beginning and that quiets down the rest of the circuit. It's probably to improve the isolation on the overall signal coming out. But then there's also one over here, one over here, and one over here. These are all in series, in sequence of each other. And they all seem to be connected to each other in terms of biasing. And the other unusual thing is that they never turn off, even when this part of the circuit is not used. So either they're being used maybe as an attenuation or maybe they're just always on. It's a little bit weird, so I'm not quite comfortable with that. But nonetheless, I started measuring the biasing on these and there is something a little bit unusual about one of them. Okay, let's measure the biasing of the first one. I'm gonna put this on this bow tie stub here. So you can see that the biasing at zero. Now I turn the frequency to 3.1 gigahertz, which enables this entire part of the circuit, and let's see what happens. There you go. You can see that the diode is now forward biased and most likely this path is therefore turned on. That's great. Now all of these other ones are always turned on. So I'm gonna measure the voltage on this one. It should look very similar to the other one because they're identical parts. You can see 0.49. I'm gonna measure the one all the way down here. 0.49. I'm gonna measure the one up here. 0.17. So that's different. So it could be that this diode is dead. And if this diode is dead, the signal cannot travel through this path. And of course, if there is no signal there, then you're gonna see very little output. So this could be a potential problem. Now this part has a marking on it of VW and no other information that I could find. It's a bit of an issue because I cannot find a replacement for it. But one thing I can do is I can remove it from the circuit. We can measure it out of the circuit. And then we can also bridge the gap between these two parts and see what happens. Now there are some challenges with removing a component like this and bridging across it. So if I remove this and just connect this wire to this wire with a very, very small piece of conductor, this may appear like a nice transition because the distance is very small. But keep in mind that this bow tie stop, these open stops over here, and the thinning of these lines, these are done to maintain a good characteristic impedance of this line in the presence of the parasitics of this component. If I remove this, the parasitics are gone. And if I bridge them, the same matching networks now actually push you away from a nice characteristic impedance because there's nothing for them to compensate for. But I think it should at least tell us if this component was a problem because we can monitor and see if the output signal becomes a lot stronger or not. And that would be a good point to try. So I went ahead and bypassed this diode and it actually helped things quite a bit. It helped by about 10 dB, which is a lot, but we're still about 10 to 15 dB below the output power of this entire instrument should be able to produce. So something else is wrong along this path. So I went ahead and just removed this entire path from the circuit by placing a coaxial cable using the ground connection over here, maintaining 50 ohm into it, and then going back down over here, bypassing again everything else and tapping right before this filter. So this entire section is now out of the circuit. This allows us to inject the signal directly from the mixer right at the very top over here. So the output of the mixer directly comes out and goes to the input of this amplifier. Now if the rest of this works, we should get a good signal and that just isolates that section. Now remember that we can't really leave it like this because those filters in the middle are there for a reason is to remove the images and the, some of the harmonics that may be present, but it will still give us a good indication if this is working. All right, let's give it a try. So here we are again below three gigahertz. That's the part of the circuit that's working. The output is set to about zero dBm and you can see it has a nice clean tone. Now I'm gonna increase the frequency and you should be able to hear, hear the switch to the upper band at some point. 2.9, three, there you go, switch to the upper band. Look, we're producing power. It's exactly what we wanted to see. Now you can see there's so many harmonics here, obviously, because that, first of all, the cover is not on there. And also I removed a whole bunch of the filters, so it's gonna look pretty bad, but the power is correct, which means all the mixers are working. Let's uh, go higher and higher in frequency. We should be able to hit about six gigahertz. There you go, and as it drops to minus seven dBm because I have removed so much of the circuit, all the calibrations out, everything's out, but it is producing roughly the correct amount of power now. So that was indeed the problem. That entire section is faulty. So yeah, unfortunately we are kind of stuck because I can't identify those parts to replace them. I will put a high resolution photo of that part uh, right in the video. So in case you know what that is, you can help me uh, find it and hopefully replace it. Uh, we can't go any further. There's no point closing this back up and do any more testing because until we do this, it's never gonna meet this specification for harmonic rejection and everything else in linearity most likely will be really bad. But nonetheless, I thought this was a quite an educational and interesting set of experiments and you can see the kind of tricks you can play 
to bypass things and while maintaining a reasonably good impedance environment so things at least roughly work so you can identify what's going on. I even removed this over here and I injected my own signal uh, at different ports just to make sure the mixers are working and everything seems to be okay. It just seems that this path here made of those individual components, something's gone wrong with it. Maybe a bias condition has gone really bad and destroyed them, maybe related to the fact that the fuse was dead because all of these share the same bias network. So it is possible that maybe they're all damaged in the same way. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know in the comment section. I'd love to hear back your feedback and maybe in a future episode, we can finally completely fix it.